The stagnation in Byzantium after Justinian's death set in motion a process that led Mecca, a trading town on the Arabian Peninsula, to be shaken by a series of processes that created one of the great world religions. Mecca was dominated by nomadic pastoralists who traveled from one oasis to another with their camel herds, and engaged in a certain amount of plunder and trade. This nomadic pastoralist society lived in loose linnet tribes, organized in clans, governed by councils of tribal elders, who fought each other and made periodic raids on the settled people beyond the desert. In the south of the peninsula, there were settled farming communities in contact with the Ethiopian civilization. As some of the nomadic families became wealthier, they began to migrate to trading centers. Camel caravans carried luxury goods between the Roman Empire and the Eastern civilizations. Mecca was one such settlement and was beginning to prosper at the beginning of the 7th century. The traditional values of nomadic clans were based on the courage and honor of the individual and the clan to which the individual belonged. There was no state, the obligation of the individual was not to the society, but to relatives. The belief structure of this society was associated with individual gods who traveled with them. These values of the nomadic clans began to fail and cause problems after some of the nomads became sedentary. Christianity developed in southern Arabia and many farmers in the oases had converted to Judaism or one of its derivatives. The mixing of nomads, merchants, artisans, and peasants in a city like Mecca was in keeping with the debates between different religious views. Arabia was neighboring two empires, Byzantium and Persia. The crises in these empires also increased the crisis in Arabia. Iran had briefly captured Egypt and Syria from Byzantium in the late 6th century, ending 900 years of Greco-Roman domination. However, Iranian society was also deeply depressed caused by the landed aristocracy's neglect of the Mesopotamian irrigation systems that had allowed the cities to flourish. The devastation of the war made matters worse. In both empires, there was mass impoverishment and social unrest. This was the world into which Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was born. Muhammad came from one of the small merchant families and grew up to earn a living as a merchant. He described the chaos around him as a mental confusion in which conflicting worldviews and values made no sense. Muhammad felt the need to provide a coherent explanation for his life and the society in which he lived. Thus began the emergence of Islam. Muhammad's preaching had much in common with the Christianity and Judaism of Arab farmers and urban dwellers. He advocated the belief in a single god as opposed to the many competing gods of the nomadic pastoralists. It replaced the old clan and tribal rules with a universal message of faith. It appealed to the poor by offering protection against arbitrary persecution, but it did not despise the rich as long as they did good deeds. In one important respect, however, this message differed from the Christian preaching of the time. It was not just a simple set of beliefs and rules for moral behavior. It was also a program of beliefs and ideas for reforming society, eliminating conflicts between tribes and ruling families, and expressing the structure of a single law, an orderly community or Ummah. This political aspect of Muhammad's teaching led to conflicts between the ruling families of Mecca, and his forced migration with his group to Medina, where he returned to Mecca in 630 AD with an army to establish a new state. Returning to Mecca, Muhammad and his army took it over and succeeded. The reason for this success was that he was able to create a core of young people who believed in a single worldview. He was able to forge tactical alliances not only with young people, but also with groups whose aims were very different, with townspeople and farmers who only wanted peace, with merchant families who were keen on the profits that a strong Arab state would bring them and with tribal chieftains who were concerned with the spoils they would gain from fighting for his cause. An Islamic state was thus established. This new state was able to capitalize on the crises of the two empires. After Muhammad's death in 632, the caliphs Abu Bakr and Umar succeeded well in combining religious principles with political pragmatism. 
Abu Bakr and Umar came from merchant families. Under these two important caliphs, the energy of the nomadic tribes fighting each other in the Arabian Peninsula was channeled into the rich cities of the Byzantine and Persian empires. Damascus in 636, the Persian capital Ctesiphon in 637, the Egyptian city of Babylon in 639, and Alexandria in 642 were conquered by the Arab armies. Thus, a powerful empire began to emerge in the Middle East. One of the reasons for these successes was based on the strategy of clever utilization of the fighting potential of nomadic tribes. Another reason for the successes of the Islamic State was that the rulers of the former empire were hated by their own people. Jews and non-Orthodox Christians, who often made up the majority of the urban population, welcomed the Arab armies, especially at first, because they did not choose to establish new state structures or to convert people to their religion. The Muslim conquerors left most of the old polities in place, and they respected indiscriminately the beliefs of Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians of Iran. All they demanded was the payment of certain taxes as tribute and the confiscation of land from aristocrats who resisted the state, and themselves. The first beneficiaries of these successful conquests were the leaders of the Arab tribal armies and the leading families of Mecca. They shared the spoils among themselves. The spoils multiplied to such an extent that within a few years an Arab aristocracy, living in newly established barracks in towns on the edge of the desert, collecting tribute from society in the form of taxes, formed an extremely wealthy but very limited upper caste system. However, because some Arab tribes felt that the distribution of the spoils of the conquests was unfair, frictions and conflicts began to arise within the Islamic army. These conflicts began to grow from the 640s, and erupted into a civil war that left its mark on the entire history of Islam. The second caliph, Umar, was killed by a slave in 644. Then there were debates about who would be the caliph. It was decided that Uthman, one of Muhammad's earliest supporters and also a member of the richest Meccan merchant family, would become caliph. The election of Uthman as caliph exacerbated the internal conflicts among Muslims. Uthman was assassinated in 656. The subsequent election of Ali, Muhammad's nephew and son-in-law, as caliph turned into open warfare between rival Muslim armies when Ali was assassinated by his own followers, known as Qarijites, who opposed his attempts to make peace with his rivals. Power passed into the hands of Uthman's relatives, who, from his own family, founded a dynasty called the Umayyads. The Umayyad dynasty murdered Ali and then Hassan and Hussein, the grandsons of Muhammad. This event in Islamic history became a call for a return to the time of Ali or the first two caliphs, a call for revolt by one social group or another against the status quo. The Umayyads, however, realized the unity of the empire by establishing their capital in Syria. Arab armies took Kabul and Bukhara in the east and reached the Atlantic in the west. This brought new riches to the Arab aristocracy, made up of former tribal leaders and former merchants. They lived in luxury in the garrison cities, spending enormous sums to build palaces for themselves. The Islamic State gradually developed into an empire. The Islamic State began to dominate vast areas and it was decided to unite this vast territory under a single empire. This led to a tremendous increase in the trade of luxury goods. Merchants and artisans flocked to the garrison cities, and settled in the suburbs that grew up around the walls to serve the needs of the Arab rulers' palaces, armies, and administrators. These were mostly non-Arabs, but they believed in religions not very different from the monotheistic religions. However, the Muslim Arabs did not want to lose to the newcomers their religious privileges, such as exemption from taxation and a share of the tribute. The new converts to Islam were therefore labeled as Mawli, and deprived of the privileges of the Arabs who had accepted them as the only true Muslims. By the 100th year of the Arab Empire, non-Arab Muslims constituted the majority in the empire's cities and played a fundamental role in the arts and commerce, which the Arab merchants had abandoned in favor of a new aristocracy. 
their importance as administrators was also growing. But they were still discriminated against. A dissident group of Muslims, called the Party of Ali or the Shiites, began to fight against this empire, which they considered to have deviated from the teachings of Muhammad. Particularly influential in these conflicts was Iran. The Iranian aristocracy continued to exist after the Islamic army conquered Iran, and the Islamic State continued to recognize their privileges. This situation led to the cooperation of the Arab state and the Iranian aristocracy. After the Iranian aristocracy converted to Islam, the Zoroastrian faith was replaced by a Muslim orthodoxy. The Zoroastrian faith of the Islamized Iranian urban society and peasants was replaced by an Islamic Itizali against both the Arab and Iranian aristocracy. As class antagonisms increased, a series of uprisings, led by various Medes, arose, proclaiming the birth of a new religious and social order. These uprisings were suppressed, but later, in the mid-8th century, there was renewed fighting between the leaders of the Arab armies. Ab al-Abbas, a member of Muhammad's family, took advantage of this conflictual situation. He instructed Ab Muslim, a freed slave of his own family, to carry out religious and social agitation in southwestern Iran. Ab Muslim worked in secret until conditions were favorable for a popular uprising. The cities of western Iran declared their support. Ab Muslim defeated a large Umayyad army and moved towards the Euphrates River. Such widespread and successful revolutionary propaganda enabled Ab al Abbas to defeat the Umayyads, kill the entire family, and establish a new dynasty, the Abbasid dynasty. The poor, who had pinned their hopes on the new dynasty and expected to be rescued, were soon disappointed. The Abbasid rulers soon began to exterminate their own extreme supporters. They killed Abu Muslim and some of his comrades. This was more than just a change of dynasty. Bernard Lewis states that this event was as important a revolution in Islamic history as the French and Russian revolutions in European history. The Abbasids mobilized social unrest to complete the reorganization of the imperial administration. Previously, the empire had been ruled entirely by the Arab military aristocracy, whose origins were war and conquest for tribute. Under the Abbasids, Islam became a truly universal religion in which Arab and non-Arab believers were treated equally and ethnicity was not at the center. A new social order emerged, based on a peaceful agricultural and mercantile economy, with a cosmopolitan ruling class of merchants, bankers, and religious scholars, teachers, judges and people of status. Having seized power, the Abbasids moved the capital to Baghdad. The Abbasid revolution ushered in a period of economic development that would last for more than a century. The great river valleys of Mesopotamia and the Nile prospered with wheat, barley, rice, dates and olives. Imperial rulers repaired Mesopotamia's irrigation canals. Cotton production, brought from India, spread from eastern Persia to Spain. The empire's trade grew to enormous proportions. Merchants traveled to India, Sri Lanka, eastern India, and China, leading to the establishment of Arab merchant settlements in southern Chinese cities. Trade also spread to Russia via the Black Sea and the Volga, to Africa via Ethiopia and the Nile, and to Western Europe via Jewish merchants. Banks, with headquarters in Baghdad and branches in other cities of the empire, and a sophisticated system of checks and letters of credit were established, which made it unnecessary for merchants to transport large quantities of gold and silver from one end of the empire to the other. The Quran forbade interest, but Muslim merchants found loopholes for this prohibition. Artisan-based industries began to develop more and more. The revival of commercial life and cities was reflected in a literature and thought in which the honest merchant was considered the moral, ideal type. During this period, religious scholars began to compile the hadiths, the trustworthy sayings of Muhammad, and the official rules of Islamic law, the Sharia. The environment created by the Abbasid state also paved the way for the development of science. Poets and philosophers from all over the Islamic empire traveled to Baghdad in the hope of obtaining the patronage of a wealthy courtier, 
landowner, or merchant. They translated Greek, Persian, Syriac and Indian works of philosophy, medicine, and mathematics into Arabic. Philosophers such as Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, and Ibn Sina, based on the thoughts of Plato and Aristotle, tried to express a rational account of the world. Mathematicians such as Al-Khwarizmi, Al-Bajani, and Al-Biruni combined and developed the heritage of Greece and India. Astronomers built astrolabes and sextants to measure the circumference of the Earth. The Islamic Empire was in a period of tremendous development against Europe and Byzantium. However, it couldn't achieve the same progress against Chinese civilization. The Abbasid Revolution opened the way for the development of trade, and enabled the urban middle class to have an influence on the functioning of the state. Nevertheless, real power remained in the hands of groups that essentially held a parasitic position on the production of others. The empire increasingly adopted the traditional splendor of an eastern monarchy, with rulers satisfying their egos and influencing their subjects through enormous expenditures. State officials sought to amass immense wealth by taking bribes and appropriating state revenues for themselves. Even traders enriched through commerce found land speculation more lucrative than investing in increasing production. Urban industries were largely based on the individual small-scale production of craftsmen. The development of larger workshops employing wage labor was insufficient, except for a few state-operated industries, to private entrepreneurs. State officials soon began to appropriate profits derived from trade as well. The developments in the rural areas witnessed in the first decade of the Abbasid era quickly disappeared. Land came increasingly into the hands of large landowners who sought short-term profits to maintain a lavish lifestyle in Baghdad. These landowners exerted more pressure on farmers and introduced slave labor to large estates. Similar to ancient Rome, peasants not only lost their land but also faced wage labor contracts. The internal troubles experienced by the Islamic Empire led to its political division, which further exacerbated economic decline. While the state's income declined, the empire's administration tried to increase revenues at the expense of the merchants. The responsibility for provincial finances was delegated to governors who rewarded themselves with increasing revenues. Governors became increasingly independent in their regions. Efforts by caliphs to reduce their dependence on potentially rebellious Arab soldiers failed. Turkic peoples from Central Asia were increasingly employed as privileged slave groups rather than performing military functions for the imperial family. Over time, the leaders of these units gained enough power to appoint or overthrow caliphs, and eventually became individuals who formalized decisions made by others. By the 11th century, the Islamic Empire was fragmented. Spain, Morocco, and Tunisia had long become separate sovereignties. The eastern part of Iran was ruled by dynasties that had no obligations to the caliph in Baghdad other than showing nominal respect. Rebels belonging to the Ismaili sect in Egypt, Syria, Western Arabia, and the Sindh region of India established a rival caliphate. Their newly built capital, Cairo, competed with Baghdad as the central point of Islam with the magnificent Al-Azhar Mosque. This region eventually faced the uprising of opposing Ismailis, giving rise to the Druze, who still exist in Lebanon today. During this turbulent period, Baghdad declined and was plundered by the Mongol army in 1258. However, Egypt continued to develop for two more centuries. With scholars competing with each other in supporting rival sovereignties from Cordoba in the west to Samarkand in the east, Islamic culture continued to thrive. Many of the problems faced by the empire affected subsequent states, but they succeeded for a while in making the existing production mechanism work and engaging in long-distance trade. Over centuries, Islam, fundamentally an urban belief, increasingly penetrated rural areas becoming dependent on the popularity of ascetics and Sufi movements in Sufism. The retreat of Islam was also responsible for the decline of scientific activities that developed during the Abbasid period. 
the religious school system, madrasas, aim to teach a single orthodoxy, especially against Shia deviations, and the religious institution tried to impose this on society as a whole. This situation eliminated rational debate. In the Islamic world, science came to mean knowing the Quran and Hadiths instead of developing an understanding of the world. This increasingly eradicated independent thought and scientific development. The rise of Islamic civilization in the 7th and 8th centuries resulted from the unification of an area from the Atlantic to the Indus River by the doctrines that gave importance to merchants and craftsmen as much as landowners and generals, initially through the armies of the Arab and later the Abbasid Revolution. However, for the same reasons, the decline of Islamic civilization from the 10th century onwards was a result of the limits of the Abbasid revolution. In fact, it was an incomplete revolution. It allowed merchants and craftsmen to influence the state but did not allow them control over the state. Balancing between urban classes and large landowner classes, the state apparatus became very powerful. Taxes were collected from all classes, and generals and bureaucrats were rewarded with immense estates. This eliminated the surplus product that could have developed the production basis of society, eventually pushing numerous peasant producers below the necessary subsistence level to keep them working, and thus total production decreased. Islamic empires began to be shaken by various uprisings. However, none of these uprisings, like the revolts in ancient Rome or peasant uprisings in China, managed to present a way out of this impasse. These uprisings often expressed tremendous dissatisfaction in a religious manner. However, they failed to propose a project to reorganize society on a new basis, 